All right, welcome again to No Occasion to Shout. In the last episode, we did Bo Burnham's Art is Dead, and that reminded Robin of a song that I just listened to that I absolutely loved called a Rock and Roll Nerd by Tim Minchin. Is that how you pronounce yeah. his last name? Minchin, right. that's right, yeah. All right, so you can give us an introduction to that, and we can start discussing it, but I'm going to do another Austin rant because uh, – Please do. Those are fun for me. So we'll just, I'll rant again, and then you can talk sense into me, like last time. <laughs> I like it. I love the way you put that. <laughs> All right. So what's frustrating, uh, we can have a whole segment of every show, why Austin is pissed off today or something. But what's bothering me this time is, do you, do you follow sports at all, Robin? Not a little bit. Not even a little bit. But I'm sure um, you have heard of LeBron James. I have heard that name. I You've wouldn't be able to recognize name. him. Really? Well, I don't even know what sport he plays. LeBron James is the uh, best basketball player in the world by far. You've heard of Michael Jordan, right? Yes. There's this constant debate about who's better, Michael Jordan or LeBron James, right now. And then, of course, all the... You have way too much time on their hands, right? <laughs> yes. It's a huge, it's a huge debate, mm. but LeBron James is one of my favorite athletes because he's intelligent. He's an intelligent sport player. Not only is he a uh, six foot eight, 250 or 200 to 280 pound, big, uh, terrifying man covered in tattoos. Um, but he is also plays the sport very intelligently. He throws passes at people when he's not looking at them because he knows what formation they're in and what plays are supposed to be made. Um, I, it's, there's a couple times where he'll be lobbing passes and it will just go like to nowhere. Like, and he'll be like, you're supposed to be there. <laughs> um, um, and I'm not sure how many times he, it's been his fault, but it doesn't happen very often though. He's very good. He scored 57 points in a game after their team lost four in a row. And then what happened is basically LeBron James plays the game of basketball the same way I go through school. He just tries to do everything at the last minute. Okay, he was playing the worst team in the league. Like they're one and eight. They're a horrible basketball team. Everybody, the Atlanta Hawks, they were supposed to this, – this was like probably betting paradise for anyone who uh, like won on the Atlanta Hawks who bet on that game because they were not supposed to win the game. But they just – LeBron didn't do anything. He was kind of just like chilling out until the last quarter. And then he starts catching up. Suddenly, they were down by 30. Suddenly, they're only down by, like, four points. But it was too late. They ended up losing the game by two points. So, basically, that's why I'm upset is because the, one of the greatest athletes to ever play the game was very smart, very talented, very athletic, isn't taking the game very seriously and is just kind of, like, I don't know. I don't have an explanation for it. They beat the best team in the league. They beat the second best team in the league. But then they lost to the worst team in the league and another team that was not very good at all. They're, they're winning all the easy games. Or you, hard games. Losing the easy games and winning the hard games. Exactly. Can you, right. you have an analogy for this? Can you, can you take this concept and pull it somewhere? Make sense I, want to, I want to know why you care so much about it. That's the most fascinating thing to me. Why is it, why is it bothering you so much that of all the things that have happened to you this week, this is the <laughs> one you want to rant about? That's what I'm fascinated about. All right. Well, that's a good question. That is a good question. Sports, to me, are one of the greatest feats of mankind because evolutionarily speaking, our brains, the brains of mammals have this play um, system, or I should say uh, play attribute, 
um, mechanic. Actually, that's actually the perfect word. We have a play mechanic in our brain, and that's how humans have learned throughout history. If you look at a baby, you can play peekaboo with a baby starting at starting mm-hmm. when they're born, actually. Mm. We have this feature in our brain that just learns through play. And as we have evolved, you see this in animals too. Animals just play. They play fight. They Mm. they have games. It's all centered around play. And as we've progressed through technology and become more intellectual, we have less of learning through play. And it's kind of been something that's, diminished proportionally less yes maybe not in absolute terms but proportionally yeah i guess I but it ex- okay it exists in sports as something that's still mature and still adult and if you look at sports i think sports is a different kind of play though isn't it i mean play is a it is. play is something that we do to it's a subset of doing. It's a subset of learning. Learning by play when you're a kid or a toddler or a baby. It's yes. a subset of learning through doing. But because your capacities are limited physically, etc., you, your the playing enables you to experience situations that naturally aren't going to come to you if you weren't playing. Right? It's a kind of a simulation. Yes. Whereas, whereas that's not what a game of basketball is about among people like LeBron James. Right? That's not what's going on there. Well, you, they learn things, athletes learn things that the regular public is struggling with. I think they learn the value of hard work. They learn the respect for other people. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, let me, um, uh, let they, me be clear. Because obviously you learn things whenever you're doing, if you're paying any attention. Yes. But what I mean is like the driving purpose, right? Like the, uh, the, the reason why someone is playing a basketball game isn't the same reason as why we're evolutionarily made to 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 play when we're kids sure um That's all. okay sure but i think they're they're at the very least you can make an argument for it and um also make an argument for what for we're evolutionary designed to play sports but sports in the sense of were evolutionary designed for uh, Darwinian competition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's what the sports thing is, right? I mean, sports yes. allows us to play out the, the commitment to a tribe, right, to a group, to the group with which we identify, um, and, and to be prepared to compete uh, to ensure the survival of the group because that favors our own survival, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes. you know, sport is kind of an outlet for that, it seems, deep deeply uh, ingrained uh, instinct. I, I think that's a big part of why we do sport, right? Yes. But <laughs> when I say we, I mean you. <laughs> yes. And, and in addition to that, it, it also teaches respect for the other tribe. The whole aspect of hmm. good game and respecting your opponent and even though having rivalries, uh, saying good things about the opponent, um, mm. I, it, it, it teaches people to – because the end result isn't to win the game. It's, and in life, your end result isn't to win a, a game. Your end result is to win the most games you can possibly can out of a series of infinity. This is all. This is Jordan Peterson right here. Yes. This is, this is the Peterson stuff. I know where you're this going. All, yeah. This is all Peterson. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, the sum of all games and uh, the meta game, which means you've got to get yes. invited back to the game. Each each of the individual games, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, that, yes. that, that, I, I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. Yes, and if you want to get back, you have to be a, a person that someone's willing to play with. Mm-hmm. You have to be, and that creates a system in sports where it allows us to be competitive and also not so aggressive. There's not much racism in sports. There is racism in sports, but it's not nearly as bad as if you go to a community uh, because everyone's focusing on the same goal. They all have empathy for that goal. Yeah, and the tribal instinct is 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 being invested in something else, right? Yes, right? Exactly. That's the thing. So you know that instinct. <laughs> you can be in one place at a time. 
So I've always been a fan of sports, and I've okay. always, I've always uh, looked up to certain athletes who I saw myself in. Mm. And LeBron James is definitely someone who I relate to and see myself in. Um, That's interesting. Yes, and he's become somewhat of a role model. Um, so when he when he behaves like I do and is lazy, it bothers me. <laughs> um, and it also it also creates uh, just a I don't know somewhere to a natural evolutionary system of rules within a game to play out your natural instincts, aggression, play sports, competition, all nested in there. So I guess I let, I don't, I don't do angry politics. I, if someone gets upset about politics, I'm out. But my, my, my anger is channeled through sports and through competition because I think it's an appropriate medium. And I think it's necessary to have that level of competition and instinct and emotion as a, as a social animal. So I guess that would be w- why I have my interest in sports. But I never get to the point where I'm that mad. It's more of a, a co- competitive type madness. So you care about LeBron James's behavior in this game Exactly why? Because it, you see yourself in it and you're disappointed? No, because LeBron James wants me to. LeBron James wants uh, us to be invested in him and his team. And he wants us to be – that's the whole thing of sports. Sports – other teams want us to be connected to the teams. If, if nobody cares about the team, then sports, sports falls apart. If nobody, cares about, right. if nobody cares about the Detroit Lions – which is where a lot of Detroit Lions fans are because the Lions have never won a Super Bowl and they probably never will. Or the Cleveland Browns, for example. Those are two teams that just have never won a Super Bowl and they don't look like they're ever going to. If nobody cares about them, then it's not fun to pick on them. It's not fun to make fun of them for their team being bad. So the, the prerequisite to sports being healthy and competitive is for me to know that there's Cleveland Brown fans that very care about their team and want them to win. And I can make fun of them because they're very bad. And uh, it's, it's part of that. As you're saying this, I'm just like, well, life is way too short. (laughs) What the, but I'm still not, I'm still not clear why you the most the thing that's upsetting you most this week is this thing that LeBron James is that I'm I'm like so you're upset because why like in a sentence this is the most upsetting thing to you this week because it wasn't predictable it's unpredictable I, I like mean, life is unpredictable if you want predictability is, you don't want life uh, hold on let's think um, what sport have you followed or have you followed any sport. Ever. No, I don't follow sport. Never? What about games? Never. What? What about games? No. Mm. What did you do for fun? I play sport. I, I'm, I'm much happier. Uh, I get playing sport. Because uh, and watching. Right? But, okay. but being emotionally invested. Like, like, okay, here's sport to me. Okay. This is what sport is to me. I am All going right. to spend emotional energy on something that is, in principle, the most meaningless thing I could spend energy on. A bunch of people are gonna move an object from here to here against a bunch of people trying to move an object from here to here. And whatever happens in that arena is utterly isolated from anything else in the world. It bears on nothing. Meanwhile, there are things going on that warrant my energy. (laughs) And so I would rather, given that, you know, Emotional output is just that, and, and there's kind of, we all have a finite capacity for emotional output. I, the whole sports thing, it's just like, it's really weird, because I get it, because I get the evolutionary basis yes. for it. So I don't, I'm not disrespecting it, and I'm not disrespecting mm-hmm. anybody that's invested. But it's really weird, because of all the things in life the, that make me feel like I'm not like everyone else, like I'm some kind of alien, this is a huge one. I just look at it, and I'm like, 
How does anyone get excited about that? I mean, there's things like going out and there's, there's scenery and there's sex mm -hmm. and there's, there's um, intellectual conversation and there's all these other things that I'm like, there's a bunch of guys moving a bit of plastic or leather. I mean, what? I mean, all right, I mean let me... go on a date or something. You know what I mean? It's like, all so, right. so, so, so I'm, and, and by the way, and I'm not, I'm not, that sounds a little facetious, but I don't mean it because that instinct for competition, that instinct for um, experiencing to succeeding in a competitive milieu. I mean, you know, not only if you go, and I'm, I just said go on a date, so I'll run with it. Not only does going on a date potentially get you sex and other exciting things, it's an outlet for that. But that's an outlet for that, that actually makes you a better person, that makes you more powerful, that makes you able to do more things in the world. That's, that's, that's you. It's not living vicariously through some, someone else. And I find that genuinely more exciting. Um, so, but you know, each to his own, that's just me. All right. I don't think I've ever said it in those terms in public because I'm probably now eating, like, put <laughs> off a bunch of people. But it's generally interesting because it's like, a, you know, I think a lot of people have this in different ways. But for me, this is a piece that I'm missing. I'm just like, I just am missing this, this thing um, that, that most people have, which is great for them because it looks like a lot of fun. But, uh, you know. <laughs> all right yeah. so here, here here's all right so i understand your point of view now so let me try to say this mm. within it within any system or social structure you are going to have competition and that competition is going to drive the best of the best to perfect it so in the situation of sports such as basketball or football or hockey or any of those mixed martial mm. arts any of those sports what you end up getting is the very best of the best trying to win and once you have sure. that they are there's a lot of strategy and perfection and skill involved so when I got into basketball and football, how I got into it, and soccer, I've, I have yet to get into hockey yet because every hockey fan I've ever talked to has not given me the uh, intellectual stimulation to appreciate the sport yet. But in all the previous versions or sports thereof, my coming to has been such that um, – I learned about the complexity, the formations mm. of, and I began to appreciate the, the beauty. And the emotional connection is not, uh, not so much taking much out of my day. It's more of a friendly and comedic um, mm. empathizing with the comedic empathizing that's a phrase that has never been spoken in the human language tell me <laughs> yes. about it. what does that mean so that means in the human language i'm not even talking properly in the english language excuse me you are yes. <laughs> so i'm empathizing with other people that watch the sport mm. through the comedy of of something that wasn't supposed to happen and other comedy. people. Comedy. The comedy. LeBron James, the greatest player on the earth, with his team, the Cavaliers, lost to the one of the worst teams ever that you that was just not supposed to happen. It's funny. It's funny that that could have happened. I guess it would be the equivalent of watching a five foot four female beating up a Brock Lesnar or Hulk Hogan. Like, it's just, it's funny. And then you get to rip on Hulk Hogan in a humorous way, and it's upsetting. And you, it's like, how does Hulk Hogan lose to this little girl? Hulk Hogan, he's six foot. And I'm telling you, Robin, Hulk Hogan, the six foot giant, I don't know, he's probably like six five. I don't know, pound of muscle. Got beat up by a little girl. 
how does that happen? And then everybody collectively empathizes like, yeah, that's messed up. How, how does that happen? Um, and it's not, it's complicated. You have to, you, you would have to go and watch sports, I guess. And Isn't that a pretty kind of banal thing to get empathic about? I mean, uh, there's a million things in there outside, right now, outside your front door that, I yes, know, but that's, it's, that's, it's a collective. You know, I mean, po- you know, we mentioned politics, and we do politics, we have politics and passion in common. I mean, so much of, so much failure in politics is the inability to empathize. And yet here we are having this, this capacity that we direct to this, if you're right, this completely contingent, isolated, meaningless arena. I yes, mean, that's well, a bit that of a shame, isn't it? Isn't that a bit of a it's, shame? It's a, social, it's a social construct. And it's yeah. a social construct that has brought people together. And I think yeah, that... I mean, I see that's the value. Yeah. I mean, I and think that's, that there's is any the value. social structure that creates people getting together, no matter how arbitrary, I'm all for it. Absolutely. I jump on the bag wagon on a lot of things just because they're popular. Just because, I mean... Ooh. Oh, that can, makes me like kind of do... Oh. <laughs> You, you know, can't. it's like, oh, just because they're popular. There's nothing wrong with that, but I don't like the. It doesn't make them feel. It doesn't sound good to me that. Well, probably <laughs> because because collectively it's not intellectual, but um, once you get into the depths of anything, if you ever think anything is stupid, it is because you do not understand it well enough. I because think that's probably true. You can get I, certainly, I certainly get the thing. I mean, I completely get the, the, the thing, the interest in the, I mean, I mean, American football, here we are, right? I get that that's a game of yeah. strategy. You know, rugby, to me, I know a bit about rugby. I played rugby, I like, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I, 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 can, I can appreciate that. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm not, and I'm certainly not saying there's nothing to appreciate, not at all. And I'm saying, I'm not certainly not saying there's no beauty in it. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that there are other things that, that matter, um, where you can, uh, you know, where you can get a similar satisfaction, perhaps more deeply. Um, and perhaps, that maybe would tell you something in so doing, say again? But do those things really change the world? I think sports has been probably one of the biggest combatants of racism ever. It's the only institution that's really made no. people people look at. Nah. Well, I mean, at I, least. I, I in, no, 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 no. Look, no. Whoa, that's whoa. So whoa, huge claim. Okay, you finish your point, and then my my friend, for example, who is p- particularly homophobic, um, but loves watching the UFC. Uh, we were watching the UFC one time, and there was a. Uh, someone that he didn't know was gay, who he really liked, who he like watched. And then he found out they were gay and it made him empathize. Mm. And then it made him change. He was like, huh, they're gay. He was like, oh, okay. Yes, they're gay. And I could see like the, the, his look and his, he was just like, I got that. He, he had empathy. And I think that happens so much with whether it be Michael Jordan or Larry Bird or like it, the race dynamic, the empathy dynamic, it takes away once you're able to empathize with someone because you look up to them. Yeah, uh, I don't think you're empathizing. I think you're respecting. And I think it's okay. different. I, I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of people, so let's say if, 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 if we're talking about a homophobe, let's say, mm-hmm. right, then they're going to disrespect someone by virtue of the fact that they know they're homosexual, right? Okay. If, I get to, if I get to watch them in a milieu that builds my respect before I find anything about their sexuality, the respect is built. And certainly it's empathy in as much as I'm now on a level with you as a human being, we're cut the same cloth, I can't otherize you. So in that respect, I agree that there's empathy. And so then you can't do that. You can't, the otherization doesn't work at that point, right? So I'm with you. And I certainly think that sport is very good for that. Absolutely. But the reason I said I don't agree with you is not that it's not a huge arena for that, um, which is a positive thing. It's just that it's one of so many arenas where the same thing happens. Well, and yes, I, I should say any any celebrity type uh, platform when there's a celebrity that that gets big, 
or anyone. I think that's the great, I don't think having a conversation with someone who's a racist and calling them out on being a racist helps because I think it just puts them in a situation where they have to admit that they're racist and then in their mind they think they're a monster or they're forced to defend themselves. Mm. Whereas when it just happens naturally in their head where there's this spark where they find out one of the person they've looked up to for so long is, um, is, um, homosexual. For example, with, with sports, I've watched, uh, basketball with, uh, my grandpa and my grandpa just goes on about, um, like LeBron, for example, he, he had a conversation with me. He's like, you know, LeBron's so smart. You know, you see, I saw all these, I, I grew up with all these, uh, athletes that were just, uh, like Mike Tyson that were just like straight from, uh, the hood that they were just pure athletic athletes and they weren't smart. The athletes of today are so smart. Kelvin Johnson, who's uh, like a 10 foot black guy who doesn't, who's very scary, um, <laughs> who you wouldn't classify as smart. He was just talking about how um, well spoken and um, intelligent these athletes are and um, the way they dress. And he was just talking about them very positively. Um, and it was just like, man, that's done wonders for somebody who grew up in a, an era very long time ago where, um, it's just, it it was warming to my heart that because of the hard work that people have put in through sports, all generations of people are able to just look up on a TV screen and really respect anyone, no matter what culture they are. No, absolutely. Look, and it's great. And one thing that I've yeah, wanted to say a couple of times is, you know, one thing that everybody can appreciate, um, including people like me who have no interest in sports, is just, you know, what a human being can do when they're disciplined and talented, right? I yes. mean, you know, I could see a clip of a, a goal being scored on a soccer pitch and go, oh my God, that's brilliant. And, and respect what it took that human being to, to do, to nurture that talent, to, you know, reduce that outcome. I completely get that. But, you know, again, that being, responding to that is a different thing than responding, from responding to what are essentially arbitrary tribal loyalties. Um, and and yeah. I, so, so for me, you know, there's a sense in which if I saw that clip by a bunch of different people, I mean, I wouldn't care what team they were. I wouldn't even know what team they were. In, right? I would just be seeing the talent, it would all look the same to me. But I yes. know for most people who are into sports, you know, when this guy does it, they're kind of upset. But when this guy does it, their guy and their team, they're delighted. That's and- changing a ton in sports. People are way more um, interested in, uh, they have their team, but they're way more interested in just individuals, um, how things are supposed to go. Um, okay. Like, it's, it's really a lot. Um, it's this really cool edifying. It's really cool to see Reddit and uh, R-Sports, R-NBA, R-NFL, and just look at uh, people's responses and just see how, how more not tribal-based it's become. It's more become a system of the whole. They're looking at the whole thing. They're looking at all the teams. Okay. They're looking at everything. Yeah. Everyone yeah. has their favorite teams, but a lot of times no one has a favorite team anymore. A lot of times there's at least two or three teams that, that people like. And see, you not- know, I've got to say, see, when you say that, see, I said there was something part of me that's missing. Mm-hmm. I just can't even understand what it would mean to like a team. Like, I've never met these people. They're doing the same thing as these other people. You know, <laughs> they do it better and worse on this day or that day. It's like, it's completely, it's so constructed, it's so artificial. It's like, how can yeah. I, how can I, I just, it's, it's weird, like, it's very strange to me. It's very, I told it's, you there's yeah, something missing. It's strangeness. Um, do, you, do you know Messi? Lionel Messi? No. Cristiano Ronaldo? These are soccer players. Ronaldo's a soccer player, yeah. I Ronaldo. The Brazilian Ronaldo or Cristiano Ronaldo? I, I, I know the name Ronaldo, but I wouldn't have been able to. Okay. Oh, man. Um, the, hmm. How do you explain that? Explain what? The, the connection to a certain team or certain players. 
Um, I guess. Hmm. You see, whilst you're pondering that, you said something okay. earlier that I found that resonated with me about um, seeing yourself in somebody, right? Identifying with an athlete. Yes. And and when I and I think it's a very human thing when you identify with someone, then you. You nest, I mean, it's, it almost is a tautology to say when you identify with someone, you, you experience some kind of emotional response, stroke, connection. Stroke. Now, yes. I, I have that. There are people whose lives like, move me to tears, right? Or, or whose maybe they express something that I deeply feel and it can move me so much. And then I, there's some kind of yearning that I feel toward that that other human being mm -hmm. um maybe some compassion maybe but and, and you could say well yeah okay robin so that's why you don't get excited about an athlete because you're not an athlete but my thing <laughs> is but people who get excited about athletes really have that say mm, they follow them they feel something like, they're not it's athletes either i just don't like it's almost like if there's any if there's any felt connection it's got to be largely projected in many cases it's got to be imagined um, you know, and, and that which makes sense because a lot of celebrity is that, and a lot of famous sports people are celebrities, and all of that. There's a lot of projection, right? Um, well, but, so LeBron James, for example, I like LeBron James because I believe that LeBron James is the greatest basketball player of all time. Um, and I want him to succeed because I think he deserves it. And I'm in awe by his, his physical and intellectual skills. So I really like LeBron James because I just believe he's the, the greatest player of all time. And do you think it's, do you think, I mean, that makes sense. I can understand that. Do you think the type of awe, do you think people have a similar type of awe for non-athletes? Maybe for intellectual figures, political figures, thinkers? I definitely feel that way about Socrates and Jonathan Haidt and um, um, Thomas it's, Howell. You experience, okay, so it's the same flavor of awe for you? Yes. Okay, okay, then, then I get that, yeah. Ron Paul, for sure. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, okay. Very similar. And I don't, the difference is, is I care if Ron Paul wins or loses. When he loses, I'm upset. Um, when LeBron James loses, I'm just confused. <laughs> How does the greatest player in the world lose? So it's like, is he the greatest player anymore? But then the next day, yeah. suddenly, suddenly he's the best athlete on the planet again. It's, um, it's a fundamentally different though, right? All those other folks you mentioned, Ron Paul, Jonathan Hyde, Socrates. Yeah. They're part of why I would find them awesome or inspiring would be because of what, are, what they've given to the community, to humanity, um, to improve their lot, to advance our, you know, to advance humanity. There's something in which, is, there's some sense in which they're making the world better should the world choose to take it on. With, with respect to an athlete, um, whilst they're, a great example of what a human being can achieve. It's not clear to me that their achievement makes, makes the world better in any way qualitatively similar to any of those other guys that you mentioned. I cannot tell you how many people whom I have boxed with um, that have said, if it wasn't for Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson, that they would be still mm. poor in, okay. in Detroit. That, doing nothing, I hear that loud and clear. Especially at, at, the, at uh, this boxing gym in Detroit that's very popular that I've used the free trials on. I go around to boxing gyms and kickboxing gyms and jiu-jitsu places, and okay. I just use their free trials. And mm. then every few years they forget that I, and I go back, use it, because <laughs> um, I don't want to pay for that. But I'll do mm. free trial sessions. Sometimes I'll do a week. Sometimes they'll do a couple sessions. But okay. So if I can it. just under, make sure I understand what you're saying, and I think I like this. Okay. Um, the, example, the example is inspiring 
that causes people to behave differently in a way in a well, way that gives them a gives them a better life and a happier experience of themselves and the world that they live in. In which case, he's very much of it. He's doing very much the same thing as the other guys that you mentioned, but yes, maybe well, less obviously, less overtly, less direct. For the first, for the first, for a very long time, uh, I think it was the four minute mile. I'm not sure mm. the exact numbers. But they didn't think it was possible. Chariots of Fire. Yeah. Yes, Chariots of Fire. And yeah, then Dear to My Heart, because that was yes. down at my uh, alma mater, yeah. Yes, in Britain. And then once they broke the four minute mile, right after that, how many people broke it? Very quickly. Mm -hmm. Because once people knew it was possible, then it wasn't so hard anymore. That's right. The, that's, the hard that's, part Yeah, now that's a phenomenon that bears a show. Um, and that is kind of how life is people don't know mm. what's possible mm. for them and then when they're able to identify mm. as someone um perhaps a gay man or a gay woman sees freddie mercury and they're like oh gay people can do that too and it inspires them yeah um because yeah. there's a lot of doubt with humans humans doubt themselves for the stupidest of reasons but when you see people like Mike Tyson, for example, who just, um, or Eminem, that you somewhat identify with, you can see yourself in, that are in, went, came from worse positions than you. It's very sure. inspiring. It eliminates that sense of doubt because it gives you no excuse. Okay, so, so, but that's true with any success story, especially Rags to Riches stories. So the reason why, you might particularly be emotionally invested in a sports figure is just that the story is always so clear to see. It's so obvious. It's yes. so, so, okay. Uh, yeah. But, but sure. everyone, every, every basketball player, every soccer player, every hockey player, every celebrity has at least at the very least one person who adores them, no matter how good or bad they are because they connect with them for whatever reason. Yeah. They used some weird word like serendipitous one time, and the kid's like, I use that word. We're the same person. <laughs> um, and they just fall for that person, and they inspire them. Yeah. I think, I think, celebrities but I think and athletes again, I think really sports, inspire people. Yeah, I think with sports figures, though, they're more, they're more likely to use the word serendipitous because the sports figure uses it, and they already like sports figure rather than. Okay, they watch someone and yes, they're using great words true. and they're using language wonderfully. And so they're inspired. You know what I mean? It's, one, it's one, just, it's, one leads to another. There goes yeah, back. Yeah, 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 exactly. Cause effect, you know, I mean, sure, sure. Who are, who are you inspired by? Let's t on Thursday, let's do the episode with uh, the, I'll learn how to play the song too, by Thursday. Because I actually really like that song. And we can it's a long it. song. I don't know if you want to be playing. I'll do, I'll do three minutes of it. Oh, okay. That's about half of it, yeah. Um, um, you're referring, just so our listeners know, we're referring yes. to the Tim Minchin rock and roll nerd song that you mentioned before that, that is, that you know what? Now we've just said it. If anybody should just go listen to it on YouTube, then they remember what we're talking about when we go discuss ahead. it later. For the, yeah, um, for, the next, for yeah. Thursday. And this episode um, will be, is sports stupid? Let's talk about that. No, no, let's not call it that because that implies that I'm making that claim and I've never said anything like it. Um, you said, you know, is is, it? How about, like, does Robin have something important missing from his brain? You know, that, that, <laughs> that, that, like, I, I'm, I'm very wary about uh, things that could be misconstrued as putting people down. Yes. Um, um, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm not, not at all, you know, and I said that explicitly. I just, I, it's just, it's a, it's a fascinating thing to me that it's all around me, but I feel like I look from the outside. You know? I feel the same way. I I criticized NASCAR for a really long time, and still until my dad told me about my uncle, who had a PhD in physics or something, and he has obsessed with NASCAR. And he, I forgot what topic we went on, but basically he he said that. Uh, he was telling me a story about his how his PhD thesis was a physics paper about the NASCAR circle arena thing. And I was just like, well, I guess NASCAR isn't as, as stupid as I thought. Maybe there's le <laughs> it's more legitimate. Maybe there's much more to it if you're really into it. 
I still don't like this. As you rightly said, Austin, there's much more to anything once you understand it. And I yes. accept that entirely. You know, just because I, to me, Amelia is, is essentially meaningless doesn't yeah. mean that there's, it hasn't got its own beauty and uh, complexity and things to teach. I mean, of course, of course. Um, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to throw, I, I guess we should be closing this show out soon, but I'm just going to throw something in that I think bears on this, mm -hmm. on how I feel about sports that okay. I haven't mentioned. And I think it's a huge thing. And I think it's a thing that our culture might do well to consider. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that there's a crisis of masculinity and mm -hmm. that there are some faux forms of masculinity. And I see it a lot in, as a European coming to America, mm -hmm. when I look at the commercials, American commercials, and American commercials seem to, many of them seem to speak to a rather superficial, obvious, um, I think slightly well, let me just say that, form of masculinity. Mm -hmm. And um, it's almost like masculinity substitutes, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got a big truck, you're more masculine. If you flip burgers on the grill outside, you're being a man, right? And I think some of that, um, there's some bits, there's a lot of, uh, what do I want to say? It would do for men in our culture to maybe be better in some ways at being men, at using their, at, at being masculine and, and being confident in their masculinity, assured in their masculinity, and mm -hmm. using it for the good in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. And I almost feel that, and there's some, there's some authentic aspects of masculinity that I think men are, are scared to show, let alone okay. even admit or experience. And I wonder if sports like the big trucks and the flipping burgers and all of this kind of stuff <laughs> is sometimes not just a, a, a displacement. It's <laughs> like, you know, um, yeah, this is, I'm going to be most masculine when I'm watching a bunch of other men do something that I'm not doing. <laughs> I think there might be a problem in that. And <laughs> I, um, we have massive problems of gender, this country, the whole Me Too thing. And I wrote a me, an article, by the way, about the Me Too thing. Um, and a link to Robin's article in the description. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, no, well, that's that's a bit of a stretch since we're talking about sport. And I've just, but, but I'm, I'm I'm suggesting it. I'm suggesting that there's a that this is a topic maybe we should broach. That is it okay to be masculine and feminine in our culture? Because I tell you that having lived in other parts of the world, it's okay it's okay to be masculine and fem feminine and to celebrate either in other cultures in ways it isn't in ours that's a big claim and it, uh, maybe we can just do it later i think staying true to yourself is very important trying to be yourself mm. also improving true yourself. thine own self be true and then as night yes. follows day thou cannot be false to any man F yes absolutely. bottom line that's what yes. we're here for that's it Bottom so I, I know myself, I know who I am. I can delineate very accurate my, genet my genetic predispositions, how I was raised, how I grew up, who I am in a, as a person, what I'm bad at, what I need to be better at. From the standpoint of masculinity, I am a very extremely competitive person. And I definitely judge people um, subconsciously, or not subconsciously, just like, judging a book by its cover on accident. And then I tell myself, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't judge a book by its cover. But I definitely have um, a... Although, although one might say, and this might be another show, until you've opened it, what else do you have to go on? That's true. But I really base mostly just with men. I will... Mm. I have a respect or a not respect for them. Mm. Um, pretty much immediately mm. and they have to earn my respect mm. and they can lose a lot of my respect very, very easily. And mm. my, I think my version of masculinity is a little bit different though, because what I really respect in other men, which is somewhat sexist. Uh, but what I respect with men is, okay, here's a good example. 
George St. Pierre and Michael Bisping just fought in a fight in the UFC. And Michael Bisping would probably have won the fight maybe nine times out of ten um, because George St. Pierre was coming off of a very long layoff from four years. He was not in shape. He wasn't very good. He won because he's very smart and he was able to capitalize on Michael's mistakes. And he's a better fighter. And he, despite being – he he came off of a very long layoff just because he thought he could beat this fighter because the fighter kind of got lucky when he won the championship. So the guy that was okay. retired for four years – He saw an opportunity, of, yeah. Okay. He saw I, an opportunity. Yeah. Mm, mm. And to be honest, the layoff was bad. He was slower than he ever looked. He was um, – he had to gain weight because he was moving up a weight class. It was kind of really disrespectful to this fighter because he was just like, what, he's champion? Oh, phew, I could become – I want to go fight him. And to be honest, it shouldn't have happened. But he was – he's he is, in my opinion, the greatest fighter of all time. And he was able to beat him by kind of getting a little bit lucky. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily luck, but it was capitalizing on something that was a mistake mm. that, that probably wouldn't happen again if they fought. Mm. Um, it might, though. But the only way he wins that fight is the, uh, Michael Bisping makes a mistake. Mm. And he capitalizes on a mistake. And I don't know how many mistakes Michael Bisping is going to make in a five-round fight again. I don't know. But when Michael lost, he kind of knew in his head, eh, he wasn't really that, that much better than me. I could have beat him. I made a mistake. And he went up and they asked him about the fight. And Michael Bisping said, look, GSP was the better man tonight, George St. Pierre. Um, he beat me. Uh, I got caught. I'll take my loss like a man. I have no excuses. There's no excuses. And they kept asking him to make excuses. Yeah. And he, he was just like yeah. – I have no excuses. I lost. I respect that tremendously. A yeah, huge absolutely. part of mas masculinity to me, a huge part of masculinity is being man enough to just not like Dominic Cruz is another example. He had like a torn ankle or torn ACL. He didn't say a word of it after the fight. Why did you lose? He was the better fighter than I have no excuses. And then later we find out not through him, but I don't, but through like weird sources that he had a, and they asked him about it, and he said, yeah, but it, it, I, I got to be honest, it didn't affect me much in the fight. It totally affected him in the fight. He's, being, he's not trying to take away the credit of another person who beat him because yeah. he's not. Whereas I'm, I'm there's other that's, fighters. That's a beautiful other example. Fighters, like Nick and Nate Diaz, who whenever they lose, they always have an excuse. And when they get destroyed, their excuse is, ah, he's on steroids. <laughs> and it's... Uh, I don't like it. It doesn't make me respect them. So a huge part of masculinity to me is being able to admit when you lose. And that's why whenever I lose things, I've been inspired by a lot of different athletes to explain, um, this is the reason I lost. Um, it was because he hit me with an overhand right that I didn't see. And um, I have no excuses for it. He timed that punch perfectly and hit me with it and clipped me, and he was the better person. He beat me fairly, fair and square. And that's a huge part of masculinity to me. Absolutely. But I, th but I think Absolutely. a lot of fake masculinity, a lot of fake masculinity comes from people making excuses and yeah. acting as if they are the best. There's nobody better than them. And the only reason somebody else beat them in something is because they got lucky. And any other night, fight again and I'll win. Um, and that screams just insecurity. Security, yeah. Uh, See, this is beautiful. I love your exposition. I am so with you on everything you've just said in the last five minutes. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. I, I'm, like, I'm like, we could do a show on that. I don't know. Every time we do a show, there are like five things that I'm going, we should do a show on that and a show on that and a show on that. We yes. should write them down. You know what, Austin? I'm tasking you with this. When we, cut, when we <laughs> close this, right, from now on, if you're cool with this, please, one, two, three, four, the four lines of the things that we could take it, we could make another show out of that we've touched on. For sure. We'll that have would a be vote beautiful. It. Yeah. And, we'll let people vote. And we, may, yeah, and we may even pick some of them and maybe throw them out to our audience. As we build this audience up, we could, we could say, look, 
we thought, Austin and Robin thought, that these four topics that we touched on are worth another show. Tell us what you'd like to hear us uh, go, you know, go on about. We'll be and that's something like sports teaches. Sports teaches true masculinity and true manhood because nobody likes the person that makes an excuse. Yeah, yeah. And I think yeah, that's you, know, a- you know what? That, you know, see, now that's interesting when you say that. This is, I see a parallel within, in academia, right? Be, one mm-hmm. of the things I like about, um, you know, I was trained in physics and I, I would have these arguments with people. Yeah, you know, one, one of my best friends in the world, she, did the, she was an English major. Mm-hmm. And so she did like critical, uh, literary criticism and, 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 and critical theory. And, and I just couldn't, I, there's just such a fundamental difference to me between physics where you got to get stuff right. <laughs> like there's just no way out, right? You can't make an excuse. It's either right or wrong. And there's no ifs or buts about it, right? Where was, and then there's something else which is really just kind of participating in the construct of the game. And I used to have these long conversations, you know, um, as the sun came up at Cambridge about the truth functionality of, sta- you know, to use a technical term, of, of statements, you know, in, in, critical, in critical theory, literary criticism. And, um, and I, I've always respected, and, I, you know, obviously in life I've dealt with folks who've come from uh, the arts and come from the sciences. And, um, and also in, uh, in business, folks who come through a corporate, uh, upper kind of a corporate uh, path, um, you know, they got a job, they work their way up because they're smart and intelligent, they get promoted and, and then maybe they're running a company, whatever. But then there's the other guy, there's the entrepreneur or the salesman mm-hmm. where you can't bluff it. You can bluff running a company. There are CEOs now, probably even a Fortune 500 companies, that you know they look like they know what they're doing because everything's going along organically fine. But they can bluff it. But you cut if if your if your next meal depends on me being able to sell something, you either sell it or you don't. If you're building a company, it either succeeds or it fails. It either goes into the black or it crashes into the red before it ever gets into the black. Right? And I've I've always had this this sneaking respect for people in in any field where the results speak for themselves and clearly therefore the talk is just talk the mm-hmm. talk is just talk and you can't pretend that the talk is the thing right it's the results of the thing and there's a certain fields in human experience human endeavor where that's the case and there are fields where that isn't the case and i've um that's a big division in in, in my experience as a human being it's a big you know Big, yeah, yeah, line in the world for me, and I think what you're saying about sports, I I, I, I completely respect that for that reason. It speaks to that. Yeah, you know, the end of the day, the result is on the board. You know, <laughs> we need more. We do, and I would say I'll be the first to say we need more of that in the world, because you know, I hear again, I can go off again. You know, in politics, people so often don't look at the results. We've got good intentions. Let's, you know, let's support the policy that has the good intentions in it. Nobody even cares about the results. Nobody cares about sunsetting something that's going to do damage. Mm-hmm. We don't insist on the results. And in sport, you've got the sport, the results of the whole story. So that's great. We need more of that. In, in, in there was, uh, there's these videos online that are just like funniest uh, answers to reporters in sports that I've watched a couple times. Okay. And there was this question, and I think it was college. And the reporter asked, how does this team, I don't know if it was Duke or Baylor or something, mm-hmm. how did they out-rebound you? Um, how did Duke, the greatest rebounding or the, a crappy team, out-rebound Baylor or something like that? And I don't need to know what rebound means in this context for this, this um, point to work, right? <laughs> no, you don't. Because okay. the player responded, well, what happened was the, that team – when the other team shot and the ball went up in the air, that team went up and they grabbed the ball and they got it. They had more of those <laughs> than we did. Yeah, right, quite. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. It's so, so ridiculous. But this is, a, you know, a, this is where my dislike of sports comes from. It's like you see this all the time with the commentary. These after the game, you know, they and they ask them these questions that are so dumb. All the answers can only be tautology, right? You know, and mm. and it's just like, 
really? And we're going to pretend that's meaningful? I just kind of, just, I do I despise that a little bit. It's a damn shame because the results are on the board, you know? The results, that's good. That's work. That's done. But then we're going to make a big deal out of it. We're going to talk and talk. It's, oh, yeah. People, and then people get paid lots of money to talk passionately about what somebody else did that they couldn't do. But these great players, are, and they get paid. I'm like, what? The, why are we giving them back? Like, that, 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 there, is a, there, there is analysis. There is, there is going back and looking and being like, well, that team was tired on the offensive end because they were characteristically missing more shots from the three-point line or on the field because the other team's defense was better, so that led to the t players being tired and that led to that team getting more rebounds. But that's not something you ask a player. That's something that, especially right after they get off the game, that they didn't watch it yet. Um, and that's something that needs to be, like, analyzed and is not yeah, really – You need a statistician. Or, you need a statistician, yeah, not a talking you head. Can't, you can't yeah. just right after the game ask him, how did they out-rebound to you? Because it's just a stupid question. And he's just like, well, because they, they had more of those. <laughs> yeah. They had more yeah. of them than we did. Because they're better. <laughs> they're better at that thing. They did that better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and that, that speaks to, like, yeah, why, why are we talking about this? It's very uh, – um, yeah. Um, and Shaq had some funny answers. I remember one of his, I don't remember the question, but one of the answers was like with your wife or something. Oh um, man, I don't remember what the question was, but he, uh, I don't know. It was just a stupid question and Shaq answered in a stupid way. It was like, what yeah, it deserved. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah. There was a lot of that. Because you're right, there is a lot of over-analysis of something that's just like the result speaks for itself. Mm. Mm. So do you know where we are, we are at on time? I don't know, but I think this is – we're probably done, aren't we? I, I think I think this is a good – I mean, we must have gone – I think we've got an hour. All Maybe right. You know? Perfect timing. Um, okay. So that's our episode on sports. Yeah, who knew? I mean, I, <laughs> I thought if you'd have asked me if there's one topic that I wouldn't touch for 100 episodes, I'd say, yes, yeah, sports. But <laughs> see what we did? All because of your yeah. frustration, Austin. So your frustration has been justified by this show. Um, or it will have been if a lot of people watch the show and enjoy it. So yes. uh, there you go. So now I've discovered a good reason to be passionate about sports. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, patreon.com slash no occasion. We're still doing that if you want to help support us. All of our content is going to be free, so we're, we're not, you're not going to get anything special. Um, we're just well, you, are going to get some, you are going to get something special, right? As we improve this, it's going to be special. Yes. We're That's not going true. to require you to pay for it, but we're going to invite you to support us in producing this. And I'm still, um, I don't know if I mentioned it last time, I'm still waiting on the artwork. That's, I, I've got it in my head. You know what the no occasion to shout branding is going to be it's in my head, um, and uh, you know once we've got that, that'll that'll be great and make this whole thing a bit more professional. But um, yeah, just stay with us and you'll see that. But right. uh, yeah, yeah, we will be want to get these numbers up and hopefully people will say, you know what, we want these guys to keep doing this. We'll throw a few shekels at them. All right, and be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Absolutely. Thanks, Austin. Thanks, Robin. All right.